Michelle and Ricky for inviting me to come and give this presentation tonight. And what timing, right? It is the perfect time to honor the 10 million plus women who helped win the war and keep the home front running during while our servicemen and women were fighting overseas in Europe and Pacific. Um, most of you know that Rosie is a symbol. She stands for 10 million women. <laughs> Uh, tonight we are going to look at the evolution of that symbol, what, how she was recruited, what she did, the challenges that she faced in both society and the workplace, and finally, you know, what happened to her after the war. So we're going to start, let's see if this works. Yes, we're going to look back a decade. And I've teased before because I've had people that do this and it takes them forever to get to the main subject. So we're going to be really fast. 1930s, of course, the Great Depression is deepening. Michigan and the Detroit industry, are, the auto industry, are hit hard. But so are married women. In 1932, June 30th, Hoover signs uh, the Economy Act of 1932. Section 213 stipulates, stipulates, if a couple both work for the federal or state government, one of them is to be fired. And of course we know which one got fired. And so then of course private businesses started to follow suit, and it was really socially and politically not seen as popular for women to start working outside the home until World War II. On November 8, 1932, FDR is elected and starts uh, the New Deal programs. These are designed to relieve, really recover and reform. I would assume everybody knows the alphabet acronyms. Border Civilian Conservation Corps, the Tennessee Valley Authority, the Agricultural Adjustment Act, the National Recovery Act, the Works Progress or Programs Administration, Lots of uh, programs designed to help relieve the symptoms of the Depression. And on March 13th, FDR delivers his first of 30 fireside chats. He comes into people's homes by way of the radio, and people start to trust what he has to say, and, and he can convey a lot of information that way. But then in September of 39, Hitler invades Poland and begins his march across Europe. Britain and France declare war. August 1st, 1940, Japan invades French Indonesia, prompting the start of the embargo of oil. And I love this. Japan looks, starts to look to the French East Indian, India for oil. But the only thing that stands between them and the Dutch East Indies, American-controlled Philippines and Pearl Harbor. September 4th, the isolationist group is formed called America First Committee. These are a lot, well, a large percent of Americans did not want us to enter the war. We had just gotten out of World War I in 1918, and 800 members strong um, resisted us entering the war, including Charles Lindbergh and my personal hero, Henry Ford. He gave me a job. Um, <laughs> September 16th, we have the first peacetime draft. Men and boys between the age of 21 and 45 are drafted, uh, and if they are drafted, they are, or they're registered. If they are drafted, they're, re they're supposed to serve one year. Of course, once we entered the war, that was extended. And eventually, 50 million men were registered for the draft, and over 10 million were actually inducted. September 24th, the Axis powers signed the Berlin Act, so they joined together. And on December 29th, FDR gets on one of his fireside chats and says, we must, we must help the Allies and become the arsenal of democracy. I get very emotional, so sorry. <laughs> um, January 6th, FDR declares to Congress uh, that we are committed to the four essential human uh, freedoms and Rockwell illustrates those very well. We'll talk about that later. January 10th, FDR announces the start of the Lend Lease program. And we truly do not only become the parcel of democracy, but the food basket of democracy. Because we provide all kinds of materials, not just war materials. Then, 
It happens. Everything changes overnight. December 7, 1941, two waves of Japanese planes bombed Pearl Harbor for two hours. At the end, 2,400 military and personnel are, and civilians are killed. Another 1,200 are wounded. 18 ships are sunk, and over 180 aircraft are, de are destroyed. Now, these are estimations. Every website and book you read has a little different take on it, but you get the drift. We were never the same. The American first uh, group disbanded and recommended everybody support the war, and young men started lining up even before the draft. The, you know, avenge Pearl Harbor. So, introducing Rosie the Riveter. Um, I have a CD that had the music. I can't find that CD, so you get my acapella version of the first chapter. All of the day long, whether rain or shine, she's a part of the assembly line. She's making history, working for victory. Rosie, or I can't hold my arms, Riveter. <laughs> The name came along. Um, two songwriters wrote a version in 43. Rockwell heard that song and was inspired to create his painting. The oil painting, as you can see from the later magazine uh, illustration of it, there's Rosie. Her name's on her lunchbox. She's got a big old riveting gun on her lap. She's got her muscles flexed and she's determined. Her or actually his foot is actually stomping on Hitler's mind, mind Kampf. But she also has her femininity. She has her red lips, her blush, and there's a powder puff sticking out of her pocket. <laughs> Rockwell will tell you the only mistake he made was he put both goggles and a blast helmet, which is pushed back on her head. I always thought it was a halo. Uh, that's the only mistake he said he ever made. <laughs> His neighbor, Mary Doyle Keefe, was a telephone operator. She was the model, but you see where he got the pose. The prophet Isaiah from the Sistine Chapel. So he kind of borrowed on that. But that was the pop, that's the one that people knew. During the war, that was the image because it came out on Saturday Indian Post on Memorial Day in 1943. This image, the one we all know now, um, was never seen by the public during the war. It was an internal ad for Westinghouse employees. It was posted by, it was created by um, J. Howard Miller. He was a graphic artist in Pittsburgh, and he was hired to create these motivating posters for Westinghouse. So this poster only showed for 10 days. It wasn't until the 1980s, 1982, that the Washington Post was doing an article about war propaganda and uncovered this. And of course, you know, the feminist groups latched onto it and now it's a sign of empowerment, right? Rosies hate that. You talk to any original Rosie and it was not about empowerment. Where you going? It was about saving lives and bringing those boys back. So that's, if you talk to them, they get very upset when you talk about empowerment. The one in the middle is actually a Michigan local celebrity, Rose Will Monroe. Actually born in Kentucky, came up with, uh, as a widow with three children. She actually wanted to become a flyer, but they wouldn't let her because she was a widow. Um, she actually worked at the Willow Run Bomber plant. And she was there riveting, she's a real rosy, and she was discovered by Walter Pigeon, who came to tour the plant. They actually named a B-24 after him, called Pigeon's Roost. And he convinced her to appear in war bond films. So she became a local celebrity. And last year, two years ago, I went to Clarksville, Indiana. She retired and moved down there. She started the Rose Construction Company. They finally dedicated a Rosie the Riveter statue in her honor. And it's right there on the shores overlooking Louisville, Kentucky. Um, over here, you probably know her. You might know her as Norma G. But she be later became um, Marilyn Monroe. So this is some of the shots.
once they took, it was appeared in Yank magazine. Uh, later on, of course, she became very famous. Okay, so first, how did we get all these women to, you know, fight for the war effort? The first wave of women were easy. These were women already working outside of the workforce, uh, or out in the workforce, but low-paying jobs. So they jumped at the, at the chance to make more money. Um, unfortunately, the downside is a lot of hair salons and small cafes went out of business because they lost their cheap help. The second wave was not as hard. These were high school graduates, young ladies, who would have gone into college or taken a respectable job in clerical or so on until they got married. Then they were expected to quit their jobs, stay home, take care of the husband and the children. The third wave were the hard ones, the hard enough to crack. These were the married women. You had to convince not just them, but their husbands. And there's a great article in a magazine called The Nation where it's called America's Pampered Husbands. <laughs> because only one out of 10 men, married men, were actually um, working outside of, the, were actually drafted. Most of them were in the essential jobs here in America, and yet they didn't want their wives working outside the household. So the, ad, the article goes on to say, well, if a woman can operate a drill press, a man should be able to figure out how to operate a washing machine. <laughs> I love that. So between 43 and 44, all these women came into the workforce, and pretty soon there were 10 million women working in the workforce. Now, the government wasn't the only ones, I forgot to tell you that. So the Office of War Information and the War Manpower Commission, they started this huge propaganda campaign. And so they had all these advertisements. The Women's Army actually went out and they helped the farmers because the farmers had lost all their farm hands. So they went to the farms. They said the one about the proud husband. Uh, but they worked in all kinds of industries, not just war industries, but everything that a man had left. Um, with the caveat, I love this, with the caveat that when the war is over, you are expected to, no matter how good you were, how dedicated to how, how, you have to give it up. You have to go back to your aprons, your spatulas, your brooms. Then the private sector also stepped in. The, those two government organizations sent memorandums and directives on how print, radio, movies, all were supposed to get, get into the minds of these women that they could do it. They can roll up their sleeves and they can go to work and they can do it. And they did. So my favorite, the Wild Comics, they actually address comic books. Um, a lot of female superheroes were created during World War II. Miss America, Wonder Woman, Miss Marvel. Miss Marvel's my favorite. In one of the comic books, she actually fights to get a job delivering telegrams for Western Union. Of course, the comic goes on to say she rescues everybody that she helps, you know, delivers telegrams. But the idea is that we're not, women weren't just needed in the factories. They were needed to do all kinds of different jobs. So how do you figure out how to do that? Well, you take a quiz. Women's Day Magazine had a quiz. Can you follow a dress pattern? Do you follow a recipe? Are you a, a, attentive to details? These are the jobs that would be best for you. And so women then felt more comfortable that their skills, what they had, were transferable into the market. Um, this is another favorite. Adele, they made aircraft parts. Mother, is your job at Adele important? And I can't read that, so I'll have to go here. I have to read this. Um, yes. Yes, dear. Any job that is in the least way assisting our fighting men is important. Mother is working harder than she ever has before, putting more and more salary into war bonds because she knows much there is at stake. So remember, Adele, we're gonna come on that again. 
So Rosie's in the workforce. They did everything. Delivered ma mail, made the bombs, riveted airplanes, delivered the mail, sorted the crops, milked the cows. The lady in the top left is actually from Houghton, Michigan, Mary Hurtness Love. She actually started the Women's Auxiliary Fairing Squad in 40, September 42. They were ferrying airplanes from factories to launching places because, of course, women couldn't fly the planes overseas. But she was doing it before Jackie Cochran and the Wasp. And she had four bases that she was in command of. One was in Romulus, Michigan. Uh, so young or old, there was something for everyone. And the, and the ladies that did the farming, Michigan State. It was an agricultural college. They offered, <laughs> go blue. Uh, they offered a six week course to teach these women, you know, how to work on farms. And at first the farmers were resistant, but when they saw how hard these women worked, they were very appreciative. So, even though they did a great job and they're going in and they're rolling out their sleeves, they face a lot of challenges. Uh, the picture in the upper left is Victoria Lake. Uh, she is trying to do her part by showing how dangerous it is for women to wear their hair down. So of course they suggested, ladies, I know you are worried about your appearance, but a turban or a scarf would keep you safe. Like women were so worried about their appearance that they wouldn't pay attention to being safe on the work site. But Hitler hated makeup. They said that you know he wanted his women clean face. So of course we had to be wearing you know victory red lipstick. And I didn't do my nails tonight, but they were wearing red lipstick um, because part of that caveat is. Society still expects you to be feminine. Even though you're getting dirty working in factories or dirty jobs, you have to maintain your femininity. And a lot of these companies actually offer charm classes or videos on you know, how to maintain your femininity while you're still riveting an airplane. You know? And what gets me is, okay, now, and please, no tight sweaters. So this is kind of a cross message to me because that means that not only are we responsible for our safety, we're responsible for the safety of the men because they get distracted. <laughs> What's up with that? The management, at first when they came in, they were, the employers were hostile because they knew that they had government contracts they could not fulfill with a shrinking workforce. So they had to hire these women and they were not happy about it, some of them. And then the co-workers, the men that were still working, they would play pranks, take long breaks, use foul language to make women embarrassed and uncomfortable. Although I just read in A.J. Bam's book, Arsenal Democracy, about a foreman at the Willow and Bomber plant who said they put up signs saying, men, please watch your language. There are women present. And after a few weeks, the foreman's put up their own sign Say, women, please watch your language. There are gentlemen present. <laughs> so, I mean, fair play, right? But not only do these women work, you know, sometimes 10 hour days, six days a week, you also had to deal with the things that were going on on the home front as a result of the war. The rationing the meant that you had to get your ration coupons, you had to do your meal planning, you had to do your shopping on top of all that. A lot of these women moved from out of state into the big cities where the factories were. Housing was atrocious. There's stories of people living in chicken coops and tar paper cabins. It was just awful. And then, what do you do with the children? All these married women, there was no such thing as daycare. And if you were living out of town, you didn't have family or friends who could watch your children. So there were horror stories about children being locked in the car while their mother was at work. Or they got, went to homes and found the babies were being taken care of by small children in the family. Or they would send the small children to elementary school with the older children. Yeah, it was just a disaster. So the government finally stepped in. And under the Landham Act, which was taking care of housing and water and so on. They also donated, I think, not donated, gave like $50 million.
million dollars, like a billion dollars in today's money, to open 3,000 daycare centers, taking care of close to 600,000 children. It wasn't enough. And African American Rosies, that wasn't even an option. They were not allowed to use that daycare facility. So a lot of private companies got into the daycare business. I was just talking to someone, Kaiser was a major shipbuilder on the West Coast, and they built their own daycare center, open 24 hours a day. All three ships would drop off their children, they would get hot meals, they would be educated, they would get naps, and when they picked their children up, they would get a hot meal to take home. They had the highest production levels of any company. I mean, so a lot of companies did this, but a lot of companies did not. And there's stories of women having to give up their jobs. Otherwise, they had to basically abandon their children. So it was a lot of challenges, both socially, because you know it was not popular for women to work, especially in these fields, as well as you know the challenges of the workplace. So changes on the home front. We had scrap drives, we had victory guards, we had food rationing, we had non-food rationing and war bonds, all to deal with while you're now working 10 hours a day. <laughs> okay, so scrap drives. We all know what a scrap drive is. We had young people gathering scrap. And Boy Scouts in Holland were collecting scrap and they would build silos right across the street on Centennial Park to collect all these metals. The campfire girls and the Girl Scouts were going door to door collecting grease, which was used for explosives. They were collecting nylons, aluminum, you know, whatever they could get. Um, and because, well, I'm not going to tell you that yet. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you that. So there was a lot of, of scrap, you know, everything imaginable they were collecting. Victory Gardens. 20 million victory gardens were planted. In 1943 alone, they sold 315,000 pressure cookers. Because you had to either dry, salt, pickle, or can. And so the government actually issued an extra ration of sugar when it came time for canning your fruits. So there was a lot going on. Our neighborhoods was create cooperatives, share what they had made, and Eleanor Roosevelt said that at the end, they provided a percentage, a large percentage of what America needed to feed itself, because all the food the farmers were growing had to go overseas to feed our fighting men and women. Rationing, of course. Who doesn't, hasn't heard about rationing? You would get these ration books, and if you were a parent, you got a ration book for each of your children. And it was your responsibility to plan your meals and look at the weekly reports on how many coupons you needed for what product, milk or cheese or meat. And then you had to make sure that you didn't run out before the end of the month. If you're feeding a baby, you don't want to run out of baby food before the end of the month. So it was very tricky. The first uh, food item to be rationed was sugar and then coffee. And then one of the unexpected ones is canned food. Japan controlled 70% of the aluminum or production. So it was hard to buy cans because the government needed the aluminum for ammo boxes and other things. Uh, let's go down. Uh, the, the war bonds. It cost the government $300 million to fight World War II. They couldn't do it alone, so they started with selling war bonds. Many people, I know have heard of it, I've got an example over there. You could either buy a bond for $25 or $10,000, worth 75% of its face value, or if you were a kid like me, you collected stamps in a book, I got one over there, and you collected enough to, to get a $25 war bond. This was promoted by Hollywood celebrities who went on tour for war bonds. Um, one of my favorite is Abbott Costello. They, they funded their own war bond tour. They went to 35, 36 cities and raised $83 million in war bonds alone. So they're one of my favorites. Um, 
Then we have Rockwell's Four Freedoms. You know, he had, they had been published in the magazine and were so popular from February of 43 that the U.S. Treasury announced he was going to go on tour with the original paintings, the oil paintings. And you could go and meet him and see the original oil works. 16 cities, $111 million raised. So that was very successful as well. Uh, then we have clothes rationing and non-food rationing. Tires, of course, were the first thing. Uh, rubber was all Japanese controlled, so we had no tires. So then they stopped uh, car production, and then they lowered the speed to a victory speed of 35 miles an hour. Not because we didn't have oil in this company and in this country, but because they didn't want you driving any more than you had to, because you're going to wear out your rubber tires. So carpool, folks. Get as many people in that car as you can or use public transportation. Another, closer to women's hearts, uh, or a lot of women, they gave up nylons. Nylons, and I'm not talking about pantyhose, I'm talking about nylons with the garden belt and the line up the back to sew it together. Those were just introduced in the New York World's Fair in 1939. A year later, they're gone. And I should say they sold 67 million pair in that first year. So a lot of women like their nylons. Um, and then they disappeared because the government took the nylons for parachutes and powder bags and other things. So you couldn't get nylons. So what did women do? Yeah. You could use tea bags and dye your legs or buy nylons in a liquid form and brush them on. And then you used your eyeliners to draw the seam off your back. <laughs> Another restricted area, the U.S. garment industry. The government, you know, took over leather and fabric. And the positive side of that is that American designers finally got to, to flourish because we had no access to the fashion houses of Europe. So Americans started designing. Magazines started coming out with these make-dos. How do you reconstruct your clothing to be more modern? There were no more ruffles, no more full skirts, no more double-breasted suits, no more cuffs on trousers. We're going to minimize the fabric. They minimize it so much that the two-piece bathing suit became very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I have one more war bond story. This is a local story. This is Grand uh, Rapids South High School. They heard about this program called Buy a Bomber. You raise so much money, you know, for war bonds, and you can pay for a tank, or you can buy a Jeep, or you can buy a pursuit vehicle or airplane. And so they decided to go after this money, $75,000 in war bonds, to get a pursuit plane. They gave themselves a, like two months. Within four weeks, they raised the money. And they said, well, let's keep going. Two weeks later, they had raised $300,000, and they bought a B-17 bomber. And that's a picture of it when they landed at the Kent County Airport in Grand Rapids. 5,000 people attended the ceremony. If we have time, I'll tell you what happened to that plane later on. I know I have a lot to get through. <laughs> okay, so estimated production. This is just an estimate of the military materials, and it doesn't include you know, all of the other, you know, the parachutes and the bombs and just so many materials, helmets, um, Battle Creek, you know, pillows, um, package rations for the military. So did Cracker Jack in, in Chicago, by the way. Um, and Alma, they, not Alma, Adrian, they made locks for the sea chest belonging to the soldiers. I mean, all these little, little things that you don't realize you need to go to war. So, where did the Holland Rosies work? I am still researching, but this is kind of a, a, a look at it. We have the Holland Furnace Company. There's an advertisement. They're looking for workers if you're interested. Uh, they made armor and sheet metal for tanks. Uh, the register, that is 
Hart and Cooley, they switched over, I think I'm in this, right? They switched over from registers to mortars. And actually, in our World War II display, we have the mold for those mortars. Then we have one of my favorite, Rosie's Holland. Um, this is Fana Doctor. I got this pronunciation because it's not too Dutch. Um, she was the first woman to work at Fafner Ball Bearings, and they were located in the Hart and Cooley factory. They made ball bearings for aircraft, and she was the first woman. So when the factory earned, where is it, their E pen for excellence, if you had good production and, and so on, you were awarded this pen. When they got the pen, she got the first one. She got to come up and give a speech. And I've actually got a photocopy of that in the ceremony on the back tables. So that was very impressive. So the, the mural in the middle is done by a local girl. Her last name is Miller. Um, and the name tag on the Rosie in the middle is Docker in honor of her. So it's very cool. Um, next to that on the left side, there is, it was called uh, specialty sportswear and then went into security sportswear. They made uh, mackinaws and jackets for the military. Down below that, the Holland Racine Shoe Company, as well as Heinz, were already hiring women before the war. But they you know, really ramped up the number of women working there. And this is actually a trophy. Those shoes are the one millionth pair that they made for the military. On this side of the mural are just some of the women that worked with Fanna at um, Fafner um, Ball Bearing. Their newsletters are fascinating. They had bowling teams and they had, you know, oh, she's having a baby. Oh, they had a birthday party. And just, I mean, a major social life for these ladies. Bottom left, um, this is, I think, is that right, Hart and Cooley? Um, they won the Bullseye Award. You could get a, an E Award for your production, but if 99% of your staff, your employees, gave to the War Bond, bond Fund, you got a Bullseye Award. You hit the Bullseye. And so one woman is standing there with all the big bosses. Uh, and then there's Chris Craft. I want to do more research. These two ladies are sisters, Ruth. Yes. Ruby, I know. Yes. You knew them, they passed away. I talked to one of their sons. Yes. Yes. And so they sent me a lot of material. But these women worked at Chris Craft. Yeah, um, in Cadillac. Yes, they worked in Cadillac. I haven't found any Rosies that worked at the Holland plant yet. And yet the Holland plant produced more of the landing craft that were used in the D-Day invasion than any other boat manufacturer. So Holland was a big, big deal. This is another picture of another uh, H.L. Friedland is the name of it. It's a really fuzzy newspaper picture I found. They were also seamstresses making war uniforms. So this is just Holland alone. Then we have other West Michigan. Um, the upper left and below it is from St. Joseph. Truscott was one of the few boat manufacturers in St. Joseph that hired a lot of women. And so the one on top is showing you in, in their nice uniforms, having finished building their boat, it's behind them. Down below, they're in their work clothes and there's a knockdown kit in front of them. Uh, next to that, Berkey and Gay Furniture Company. People who have been to the Pond House have probably heard that name. Uh, they made a lot of furniture that is in the Pond House, but during the war, that was an advertisement that they would train women. And they were making glider and airplane parts. Uh, we have Grand Haven, the Peerless Glove Company, making all kinds of dress uniform gloves as well as work gloves. Um, the Canfield production uh, manufacturer making antennas for aircraft and the plastic nozzles, nozzles that go over it, the shields. Up above is Muskegon. There is one woman working on their production line, but Muskegon had five major factories that hired lots of women, from Brunswick to Continental Motors to Sealed Power. I can't remember all of them, but a lot that 
has really, they call themselves the arsenal of democracy. Um, Bottom right, Gibson guitar. I love this story. We have a book over there about it. These ladies made airplane parts, but they also made guitars. Um, for a long time, the company denied that because who wants a guitar built by a woman? We want some old craftsmen, you know, experience to make these. So if you find a guitar that has a banner on it, it's called the Banner Guitar. It's worth a lot of money, and it was made in World War II and probably by these women. Uh, finally, these two are Kalamazoo. The Kalamazoo stove works made flares. And um, so these ladies are packing the parachutes that are going to go in, so when they drop it, you know, the, it would flare, and here they're packing the parachutes. Okay, good here. Okay, between 1940 and 45, female workforce grew. Yeah, rust. By almost 50% from 11.5 million in 1940 to 20 million in 1945, and that included all jobs. War production, you know, transportation, agriculture. One out of every four women entered the workforce. Female employment in defense industries grew by 463% between 1940 and 44. 1944, women held one third of the jobs in manufacturing. Uh, between 1943 and 45, they did polls. 61 to 85 percent of women wanted to keep their jobs. The city poll indicated, boy, that's a typo, that uh, 40, 47 to 68 married women wanted to keep their jobs after the war. And also 350, nearly 350 women served in uniform. So what happened to Rosie? Where did she go? Remember that caveat. When the war is over, you're going back to being a housewife. And so I love these. I don't wear the pants in my family, but I buy them. Oh, you mean a woman can open it? <laughs> and then, of course, all these appear. You know, the pressure. The, the government started a campaign called the June Cleaver Campaign <laughs> to get these women back in. But my favorite is Adele. Uh, mother. When will you stay home again? That's like, really? Okay. All right. Some jubilant day, mother will stay home again, doing the job she likes best, making a home for you and your dad when he gets back. So there was pressure. The women who wanted to stay in the factories could not stay in the factories. The women who wanted to keep their jobs, if there was no men who wanted it, they could. There was a percentage of women that did stay in the workforce, but nothing compared to the tens of millions that were in the war. I don't have time for the other cool stories, but if you look up American Rosie the Riveter dot org, dot org dot net, I put it in the next slide. I've written stories about these different topics. The Holland Sugar Company, which the migrant workers didn't want to come back up. They were afraid during the gas rationing that they would be not able to get back home. So the women, Sally the Slushers, came in and brought in the crop and, and processed millions of pounds of sugar. Of course, the POWs at Heinz, I've got a book over there about that, the Civil Air Defense, the Japanese balloon bombs. I don't know if you've ever heard that story, but I want to get to the museum where that balloon is. Uh, Milky processing. In Petoskey, we couldn't have access to the materials that we needed for life jackets. So they did experiments and found that milkweed is what worked. And so Petoskey became the center of this production. And of course, then Black Rosies and other minorities, they were the last hired, the first fired, the worst jobs, as you can imagine. And there are untold stories about these ladies. And a new video that came out last summer. Okay, so American Rosie the Riveter Association, rosietheriveter.net. We work hard to maintain the legacy and the stories of these amazing women. They had moxie. I love that word. We need to use it more often. Despite the challenges by society and by the, the workforce and all the other things going on at the home front, they persevered and they were very successful. If it wasn't for them, 
We wouldn't have won the war. The country would not still be running. Um, so we have videos, or I have pictures of some of the women. We help them celebrate. We make sure that they get to events. We put them in parades. Um, we, you know, we celebrate them. We dress like Rosie the Riveter. We had 3,000. 734 people dressed like Rosie and won the Guinness World Book of Records <laughs> in 2017. They say people dress like it because several men dress like Rosie and snuck in. Um, but then after they pass, we also honor them. You can't see it, but this is the, the statue in Clarksville, um, Indiana. We also have post or the banners that we put on the light poles along with our servicemen. And the center round bronze one is actually a grave marker. And I have offered to do that for the Samuelson sisters, and they haven't taken me up on it. But you know, a lot of women would have that put onto their headstone. <laughs> so that is what we do. Of course, many of you know, next month, in 2020, they actually, Congress approved uh, the act of, us, of uh, giving the Congressional Medal of Honor to the umbrella Rosie the Riveters. And they are having a ceremony next month in Washington, D.C. at the Capitol, uh, and I will be there. <laughs> we took Rosie's on a private jet sponsored by Boeing two years ago, and that's the group of Rosie's that went with us. We have 10 Rosie's, and I was hoping um, Sylvia would be here. We have a Rosie that lives in Holland. And I'm actually taking her and her daughter with me to the airport um, because we have 10 Rosies. The youngest is 99, the oldest is 103 going for this ceremony. So I can't imagine how many across the country are going to come for this ceremony. And I got several designs here because they haven't unveiled what the coin will look like. And I won't get my replica until I, way after the ceremony is done because they haven't minted them yet. So, calling on Rosies, I hope that you have a, a better understanding and better appreciation for these women who really, despite the obstacles and everything else, you know, determined, persevered, and won World War II for us. Oh, the servicemen kind of helped. Yes, so the recording and people who are using the loop can hear, so you have to use the microphone, so I will bring it to you in just a second, but I just, thank you, Deb. That was everything I thought it was going to be. <laughs> oh, that was amazing. That was more than you were expecting. <laughs> that was amazing, so thank you so much. Um, yes, so if you have a question, I do ask that you use the microphone so that everybody can hear, plus we get it on the recording and anyone using the loop can hear, so I will bring the microphone back to Deb there. I like your name. <laughs> First of all, Lyra Rogers, uh, she had some high school students collecting the... Um, the shrap. Yeah. The milk, oh, the milkweed. Very and good. then they found out, they, I think they found out that the milkweed, something better, better than milkweed. But, um, so if you're a Rosie the River d descendant, like I am, my mother worked at the Campbell plant and actually lost an arm, and she had five brothers who were all in different services, all came home, she was the one who was born. Now, is there a plaque? Did you want just talk about I didn't plaque? I didn't talk about it. At Willow Run Bomber Plant, well, at the Yankee Air Museum, which is where I worked with the drill team and so on, there is a wall of honor. And if you have a descendant who was a Rosie, you can have her name put on that wall. Just go to the Yankee Museum's website. And as a descendant, you are officially a Rosebud. Oh, okay. <laughs> If you are a female descendant, you are a rosebud. If you are a male descendant, you are called a rivet. <laughs> I think they should be called a thorn. <laughs> yes, there are, there's a lot of ways that we honor the rosies. <laughs> Uh, because I'm always interested in the art aspect. 
aspect of things. You mentioned that the original Rosie poster was not necessarily an image of empowerment. So right. at what point did that kind of switch over? When the Washington Post discovered that, it was shortly after that they put out this article about war propaganda, which was considered by many the most successful advertising campaign in ever in this country. Um, they, they rediscovered that poster and that's when they said, oh, this is a great symbol for our cause. You know, we're, we can do it. In fact, before you leave, you can all have your picture taken in front of the poster. You have to put your hand out, turn it up, grab, cross, lift. <laughs> I was really, really supposed to step forward and do it. <laughs> So you had an article that said that one, it was in the top center and it said women are teachable. Oh, oh yes. Can you read what well, I could not read what it said, yeah. I just have oh, to know. <laughs> yes, it said that when you're supervising a woman, yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was a whole manner for all these mandos a company put out to teach these foremen and bosses how to deal with women. <laughs> how do you deal with women? They are emotional. And so it's like you supervising women, they're teachable. They are human too. You, know, you have to remember that they're dealing with you know this and this and this and treat them with respect and they can learn. It was it was it was insulting. It was really insulting. <laughs> Did you want to, you wanted to know what it's Oh, okay. When you supervise a woman, make clear her part in the process or product of which she works. A flow allowed for her lack of familiarity with museum or familiarity with museum processes. Seeing that her working setup is comfortable, safe, convenient. Start her right by kindly and carefully supervising. Avoid horseplay or kidding. She may resent it. Suggest rather than reprimand. When she does a good job, tell her so. And listen to uh, and aid her in her work problems. I mean, the pages just go on and on about, yeah, it's really insulting. <laughs> uh, Debbie, you talked about child care on the West Coast, mm -hmm. Kaiser. Kaiser. So, is that where child care started? Was there no child care in the United States before that? There was, they said that daycare was a new concept. So there may have been a few in major cities. I haven't researched that, but they said, you know, on the whole, it was unknown. And it, the government for the first time got involved in child care. But as I said, it wasn't enough. I mean, 3,000 centers, considering all the manufacturing that was going on in, in this country, um, and Kaiser was just one example. I'm sure, I know Willow Run did not have a daycare center, but I'm sure there were others, possibly in Michigan as well, um, that were there to help take care of the children so they could keep these women working. I'm done. Any questions? When they finally gave her her production E, she was as proud as any girl can be. That little frail can do more than the male can do. Rosie, the Ravener. <laughs>